So if you want to be big on YouTube, you have to have some kind of Infinity War hot take. And boy do I. I also had a lot of general little observations about the movie, so I thought I would front load the video with those, put the hot take at the end. That's how you do internet content. I'm just gonna go chronologically. Oh, and I know the internet gets really fussy about this, so yes, this video will contain multiple spoilers for The Twilight Zone. My favorite thing about this movie is that it was so unapologetically comic booky. Like, more so than any other Marvel movie, there was clearly no self-consciousness over losing the audience by being too referential to geeky comic book storylines or silly imagery. Like, Marvel is fully confident in its hold over its audience. It is not worried about losing them by having Thanos' weird skeleton goblin-looking henchman guy or Doctor Strange's stupid-looking spells or big purple-chinned Thanos. Oh, at the beginning of the movie, Tony told Pepper that he wanted wants a baby and Pepper was like, I don't know. The fact that he mentioned it means that Tony's gonna die in part two and then after his death, Pepper is gonna find out that she's pregnant. And then you can be like, oh, even though he's dead, there's gonna be a baby, so it's okay. This is what always happens. Part two, by the way, is not gonna be called part two. They went out of their way to tell us this, but pardon me if I call it that. Loki dies like a dog and <laughs> it's harsh but kind of funny. Here are the deaths that I think are gonna stick from Infinity War Part 1. Thanos? What? No, not Thanos. Thanos doesn't die. Leave it in, Jenny, leave it in. Loki. Vision. That's it. Oh, Hawkeye! Hawkeye didn't even die. They just callously wrote him out. That was also funny. Does anyone else feel like Thor Ragnarok was kind of ruined by this movie? Like, it ended on the uplifting note of Asgard isn't a place, it's a people. And then smash cut to Infinity War and it's like, the people are now dead. So, yes, Asgard is over. Whoops. And isn't it kind of weird how fast Thor bounces back emotionally? Like, I know they gave him a token line later where he's like, I have nothing left to lose, I've lost everything. But he's still able in the Guardian scenes to like engage in the jokiness with those characters. I still can't take Doctor Strange seriously and I never will. I like that he'll literally just be talking to someone like a normal human and he'll be like, we can't let Thanos get the Infinity Stones. And you're like, what? Did the dance enhance my understanding of what you were trying to tell me? I will say one of the biggest reactions I heard in this movie from the audience of any character getting hurt is like Doctor Strange's flying blanket tried to attack Thanos and Thanos like batted it away and I think you heard like a ripping noise and people gasped. They were extremely upset. People love the blanket. I had no idea Peter Dinklage was gonna be in this, so that was a cool surprise. But the thing is that like, since his Game of Thrones success, something I have found very cool is that Peter Dinklage has started to be cast as things where it literally doesn't matter that he's a dwarf. Like um, in X-Men, he was just some guy that was not a dwarf in the comics. And um, he was in like a bad Melissa McCarthy comedy movie. I don't know if that's a great example, but it also didn't matter that he was a dwarf in that. And it's just kind of refreshing to see someone cast like purely from talent when they are a dwarf and they're not cast as like a little guy in, in like a suit. In the Marvel universe, Peter Dinklage is a dwarf, but it's like, like the fantasy creature dwarf, like Lord of the Rings status, almost literally Lord of the Rings. Almost in every way, like Mines of Moria, Lord of the Rings dwarf. And I'm kind of like, is this okay to do? Because I would imagine that even though dwarf is one of the acceptable things to call people with dwarfism, I just kind of imagine that maybe they don't love the fantasy connotations of, of their whimsical name. And I guess in Marvel, dwarves are 10 feet tall because they use this horrible effect I didn't even realize he was supposed to be tall for a minute. I was just like, could he not be in studio that day? And they had to green screen him next to them unconvincingly? And the answer is maybe. And that yes, they did green screen him next to them unconvincingly, but also he's supposed to look big. Like Peter Dinklage stood in front of a green screen and then they stretched out 
the image of him acting to this big and there is no point where it doesn't look exactly like that's what you're looking at. And it was like the only bad effect that stood out to me and it seems like it would be simple to pull off. I don't know why it looked bad. One story element I was really worried they would abuse is when Thanos gets the reality stone, he can make you see one thing when another thing is happening. I was basically worried that at any given time, an entire scene could just be retconned by having it be like, Thanos made you think that's what happened. I mean, they could do that with like the whole movie if they wanted to. It's like that episode of The Twilight Zone where there's the disillusioned businessman and he's in an unhappy marriage. And then every night on his commute home, the train stops in this idyllic 19th century town and everyone out the window is really friendly and they're beckoning him and they're like come on down to the fishing hole we made you some fresh lemonade and finally he's fed up with his life he gets off the train at that stop and then it cuts to some guys being like we don't know what happened he just jumped off the moving train to his death and the name of the town was the name of a mortuary van what does it mean it was all an illusion fortunately Thanos didn't really use that power again so it was fine anyway that was a cool scene I liked the effect when everything melted away and you saw that the collection collector's collection was actually destroyed and in flames and definitely the only reason the collector survived is he has to be alive to operate his theme park attraction, Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, only at Disney's California Adventure. There's that moment Thanos has hold of Gamora and Gamora's like, Peter, shoot me. And Peter's like, I don't want to shoot you. And Thanos is like mocking him like, do it. Do it, Peter, shoot her, shoot her. And it's just like every time I bring a boy home to meet my parents. But the issue is that Thanos is so overpowered that like watching him fight people is not enjoyable. It just kind of feels like a formality. Like we established at the beginning of the movie that even just with a couple of the Infinity Stones, Basically, he's gonna beat everybody in a fight, but the whole movie is just various clusters of superheroes not thinking of a better plan than when he gets here, we'll try to fight him. If I was the Avengers at this point, I would just do it the way I do Halloween. You turn off your lights and pretend not to be home, put a plastic cauldron out on the porch with the infinity stones inside, and leave a note begging them not to hurt you. To get the soul stone, Thanos has to sacrifice something he loves, and Gamora's immediately like, ha! You don't even love anything. I'd hate to be you. You look pretty foolish. And you're like, girl, learn to read the room. So Thanos throws Gamora to her death and it's bad. And it's like, it's not bad that it happened. I mean, I guess it is bad that it happened. The first two Guardians of the Galaxies set up Thanos as this character where he's like an abusive father. It seems like there wasn't a lot of warmth in that family and if there were good times there is no inkling of them in the first two movies and then suddenly in this one it's like no, he was really nice when Gamora was little. And I just don't know if a take as nuanced as sometimes you can have an abusive parent but there can be good times too and that can be emotionally confusing can really be applied to a guy who murdered most of his children, dismembered at least one of them, and pushed the remaining one off of a cliff. Like, what are we supposed to take away from the fact that he, as confirmed by space magic, loved Gamora? True love. And that after she died, Mantis has to go out of her way to tell us that he's in anguish. The movie is trying to get us to empathize with Thanos, and don't tell me that it's not, I know that it is, because the last thing we see of Thanos is like a quiet emotional moment with him, feeling content and reflecting on what he has lost. But Thanos is just a big purple evil guy who looks like a cartoon and wants to kill 50% of everyone for no reason. And yes, I am aware of his reason in the comics, it does not apply here. In the movies, he has no reason except for like population control. And he tells us that Gamora's planet is a paradise now, but in what way has he proven that the ends justify the means, even from his weird perspective? Like when he goes there, is there really no lingering resentment over the time he slaughtered half of their population within living memory? And, or is it just that the resentment is there, but he's really bad at reading social cues. Like they're just afraid of him and clearly simmering with rage and he's like, it's a paradise. And as big and varied as the universe is, aren't there underpopulated planets or empty planets? And can't Thanos just 
send people to live there? I mean, forced relocation is unpleasant, but the alternative is worse. On Earth, wiping out 50% of the population doesn't even set us that far back on like our timeline. I mean, at least if his mission statement was, I want to kind of impact the population and just upset everybody. You'd be like, at least he has realistic goals. He knows what he set out to do. Oh, and by the way, when Gamora goes to the place the Soul Stone is being hidden, Red Skull is there guarding it. And in my theater, there were like confused cheers and then like an immediate like, should we have cheered? Also, I'm sure that this is a job that Red Skull really had at some point in the years and years of comics and that in those, it was set up and felt natural. But wasn't Red Skull just like a guy and he took the same serum as Captain America and it messed up his face? So if so, in what way does that make him qualified to be like a space ring wraith guardian? man. I mean, should I be happy he's there? Like, it doesn't seem like a fun job, but it does still feel like he got off easy. At the end of the movie, half of everybody in the world dies. <laughs> Spoilers, by the way. And they start with the Winter Soldier, so right away you're like, hmm, because I heard that he was supposed to take over for Captain America when he dies, because Chris Evans is leaving after the next movie. Spoilers. Then the second one is Black Panther, so you're like, okay, like, he's only had one movie and it made like a trillion dollars. So already, like, suspension of disbelief is kind of not there. And then just in case there's any doubt in your mind that these deaths aren't going to be permanent, they kill Baby Groot, the literal money tree. So by this point, you're kind of like, yeah, whatever happens in the next several minutes, it's not really gonna matter and you're able to just kind of relax and kick back and enjoy. But at the screening that I was in, people were like not responding that way. And I'm not talking about kids. This was a midnight screening, so it was primarily nerdy adults. So like loads of adults were gasping and screaming and wailing in misery at these character deaths and it just became really funny. You're like, you guys, it's gonna be okay. And then they kill Spider-Man and at this point, I'm just like reveling in it because the reactions are so good, I'm just like, yeah, kill more, kill them all. Because I'm in a theater where people honestly believe that Marvel is killing 50% of its cast. Basically in any universe, when you introduce an artifact that can reverse time, the stakes are just gone. And Doctor Strange had that scene earlier where he's like looking at all the possibilities and then his last line to Tony is like suggesting that he knew that in the one time where they won, Thanos got all the stones, so everything is going according to plan and it's fine. Also, I haven't read the comics, so I have no idea, but I feel like in part two, which is not gonna be called part two, it might be revealed that all the characters who died have actually been split off into another reality, and they could either do this or not do this. I just feel like they might because a lot of characters that got killed were fun and it would be like a boring bummer to not have them around for the whole movie. But maybe they won't do that. Maybe part of the intent was to pare down the cast for the second part because especially if they're actually writing out characters after the next one, maybe they want to focus on them a little more. It's a lot like that episode of The Twilight Zone where there's the power-hungry little boy, and if he perceives people as troublesome or bad, he will wish them away to the cornfield, and you don't know where they've gone. You don't know if they've gone to a different plane of reality or if they're dead and he's vaporized them. It's like you have no idea, they're just gone. You're gonna have to wait and find out in this case. And also, Finally, I just love the shot of Thanos at the end where he's like content and looking out over the, the fields. I just liked his contented expression because it seemed like it was a moment that was perfectly set up for product placement. Like I just wanted his big purple hand to lift into frame and he's holding like a Bud Light and he's like, ah. Actually, he'd of course be holding it in the gauntlet. Anyway, look at the time. It's about time for my hot take. Anyway, I've solved exactly how Infinity War Part 2 is going to go down. It's not called Infinity War Part 2, the second movie. If you don't mind, I would like to tell you about an episode of The Twilight Zone. This episode is called Five Characters in Search of an Exit. You have an army guy, a hobo, a bagpiper, a ballerina, and a clown. The five characters wake up in a round, empty room with high metal walls, and none of them remember how they got there or where it is. So basically, the whole runtime is filled with them puzzling about this and trying to get out. Then, the twist at the end of the episode is that they are all dolls, and they are in like a donation bucket for the Salvation Army. Yeah, it's a dumb twist. There's no moral, like Rod Serling comes out for his closing monologue, and it's basically just him being like, 
That's weird, right? Sometimes people are dolls and you don't know why. You know what? The Twilight Zone ran for five seasons. It had some really good episodes. There are gonna be some duds, it's fine. So anyway, Infinity War Part 2, working title. It's revealed that what's really going on is the Avengers are all action figures. The reason half their friends faded away is they've been purchased from the store, but the kid who got them his mom wouldn't let him get the full set. Toys R Us is going out of business. You can get a lot of them, but they add up fast. You're gonna have to make some tough calls. Look at our surviving characters. Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, Rocket Raccoon. It's a tough choice for any child, but I feel, if pressed, these are maybe the characters he would prioritize. To reunite the Avengers and take down the evil action figure of Thanos, the remaining Avengers are gonna have to bust out of that toy store and get to that kid's house before moving day. And that's why Marvel told us that the next movie, set for release in 2019, is not gonna be called Infinity War Part 2. They were dropping us hints. Because you know what other movie comes out in 2019? What other film, shrouded in secrecy, has actually been the same project as Infinity War Part 2 all along? Oh, that's right. Toy Story 4. When they put the text at the end, like, Thanos will return. I know they were just kind of being a bit cheeky and like everybody booed and stuff, but if it was me, I would have just put the text, the end. Like, yeah, that's right. I think it would have actually started a riot. I loved the power move of having the after credit stinger just be two more beloved characters dying. And of course the reveal on Nick Fury's pager at the end that the Green Lantern Corps are gonna be in the next movie, like, they have been so neglected in the MCU so far, and I'm really excited to see what they do with them.